So as we get started, um, I'm Emily Dunham, and I work in DevOps at Mozilla Research. So I basically put out whatever infra is the worst on fire. Um, oh, come on. OK. We're going to do it the hard way, are we? Um, there we go. Um, and I'm here to talk about the automations that we've put in place in the REST community. We're just going to mirror all of our displays then. Um, sorry about that. Now, there we have it. OK, so you can get these slides um, at that URL. If There will be a bunch of URLs in them, and they go by fast. So I would encourage you not to try to take all of the notes, but instead um, just grab a photo of that and look them up later. You're welcome to ask me any questions you have on Twitter, email, IRC, whatever's convenient. So as Herman just taught you about, anyone who um, just came in the room and might not know, Rust is programming language designed to be safe, concurrent, and fast. We've been stable for just over a year now. 1.0 came out on May 15th of 2015. Um, you might have heard of it because it was the most loved language in Stack Overflow's recent developer survey with almost 80% of respondents saying, yeah, Rust is awesome. In the Rust community, you can engage with us on all of these media and more. Um, and we have a variety of automation tools um, that help us have a relatively small team manage a relatively huge community without a lot of the problems that I've seen befall other projects. So what automation basically is, is offloading something repetitive, something boring, something annoying onto some system or process that makes it so you don't have to think about it anymore. There's two ways that I've seen the rest um, project automate its community. The first is with social processes. And these are harder to add on to another community, but if you're starting something from scratch, I think you can learn a lot from the project. And I have personally been taking these away as lessons whenever I'm involved with something brand new since I've learned about them. And the second half, of course, is our helpful team of robots, which are a lot easier to add to an existing project. And I'll show you those second. So, the first process that I've seen help shape the REST community and help prevent um, a variety of problems is the incredibly high expectations that people have of it. You can say it's a bad thing, you can say it's a good thing, but like it or not, the community's called our not-so-secret weapon. People say, the community's populated entirely by human beings. I have no idea how this was done. Well, these, these tools and techniques are how it was done. Um, and so setting those high expectations makes, it, makes you think twice before you snap at a newbie who asked the common question, makes you think twice before you make a comment that might sound um, misinterpreted, because you know, I'm a member of the REST community. We're famous for being welcoming. The next, and probably the bedrock of the entire REST community, is this code of conduct. It's not a whole lot of words. You can fit it on one page if you don't mind a small font. The first blurb is the rules that we absolutely expect everyone to adhere to. And the larger blurb is precisely how we enforce those rules. So here's the first piece of automation. It really stinks to have to nag people to behave themselves. And so the tools where people communicate, by and large, do it for us. You can't post on our subreddit without getting a big banner in your face, hey, remember, code of conduct's a thing. Um, your first three posts on the forums, which we use instead of a mailing list, um, will tell you how to make a good post, give you a few suggestions, and remind you of the code of conduct, and can't get into IRC without seeing it as well. So the result of having this from the very beginning is that some people are excluded. There are some people who don't want to work in the way that the code of conduct specifies. And this is one of their reviews of it. They say, the community gives me a bad feeling. They're tyrannical. They have a moderation attack squad. And this sets off warning alarms. We have excluded this person. I would give them credit for that wonderful quote, but unfortunately, they posted it as anonymous coward. Um, we are missing out on whatever technical skills they may bring to the table. But in exchange, we get the technical skills of everyone who might have been driven away by the flame war type behavior that people who um, violently dislike codes of conduct 
often tend to engage in. For what it's worth, in over a year now, engaging with the REST community pretty much all the time, I've never seen a conversation that I would describe as a flame war. So another piece of process that helps automate the way we work together is mandatory communication about design changes. So no one expects that they can do a big refactor or add a big new feature without talking about it first, because all major changes go through the request for comment or RFC process in this public GitHub repo that I've linked right there. And I have a theory that the more time and energy and effort you've put into something, the worse it hurts to get told, no, that's not the direction we want to take things. No, we don't want that for the thing that you built it for. So the way I see the RFC process functioning socially is that it helps us catch ideas that won't work super early so that you've only invested a little bit of time and so it doesn't bother you nearly as much to have to change it or to be told, no, this isn't the direction we're going. Whereas I've seen a lot of other communities say pull requests welcome as a way to defer those design conversations. Someone comes back in a few months with a fully formed feature and then you have to talk about, no, this isn't our direction. And that really hurts to be told that your months of work aren't of value to the project. So RFCs help with that. And finally, we have this cultural habit in the REST community that starts out in the core team and seems to trickle down to most of its projects of calling out people with appreciation for them when they do things that stand out, when they do things that go above and beyond. Um, our This Week in REST newsletter and the official blog will sometimes call out a person who's a friend of the tree, the tree in this case meaning the REST repository. This is just someone who's done something that might not be super well recognized. Maybe they retriaged all of the old issues. Maybe they did um, some nasty code cleanup that nobody wanted to touch. And we publicly thank these people because otherwise they might go unrecognized. So this is basically how the process part, the social bits of the REST community help make things work more smoothly and work well. We set high expectations. We actively exclude people who won't resolve their disputes via moderation, who demand verbal trial by combat instead of polite discussion. Um, we require communication before major changes, and we make it simple and clear exactly how that communication is to be done, and we make a habit of showing community members that we appreciate them. These are all processes that are great to have and really rough to bring into an existing project that doesn't have them yet, especially excluding the people who don't communicate in the style that you've decided you want to, because if you have a mixed community without um, agreeing on a code of conduct, and then you try to enforce one, you're going to, the people who won't live by it are going to have to leave. And that's really difficult. So if you get the chance to be in at the ground floor, um, I would strongly recommend making sure that you have the processes that you're going to want to see later. Like you cannot overstate the importance of starting out um, with the community values that you hope you'll see down the line. So this brings us to the robots. They are a variety of tools and processes that literally do mundane tasks for us. Um, they, are part of, they are part of how such a small main team with relatively little people hours to spend on the project managed to get a lot done and interact with a lot of um, part-time community members. Before I tell you about our most important robot, we need to take a quick trip into history. Um, Graydon, the original author of Rust, was a software engineer for many years and came up with a principle about how code repositories should be managed that he calls the not rocket science rule of software engineering. The not rocket science rule simply says you should automatically maintain a repository of code that always passes all the tests. How many of you, by a show of hands, have worked on a repo that automatically was kept to always pass all the tests? A few people, maybe a quarter of the audience. How many of you have worked on a repo where you really wish that it was forced to pass the tests before you could merge code? Yeah, just about everybody. So this sounds deceptively simple, and it's 
quite a big culture shift um, to say, no, we can't merge until we fix the code or fix the tests. Fortunately, we have a bot to help us enforce this. The way the REST project enforces the not rocket science rule is a bot named Bors, who his um, underlying code was rewritten to be more scalable and uh, in a project named Homu, but his account name is still Bors because um, historical reasons. So what he does is after someone reviews the PR and says, yes, this should land, in our parlance, that's an R+, plus, he figures out what the tree will look like, what the master branch will look like after that pull request has landed. He runs the tests, all the tests, on that. And if all of the tests pass, he merges automatically. He fast forwards master to that state that he just tested. Now, if it doesn't pass, then he says, oh, nope, got to go back, got to try that again. Um, you need to fix these things. And as well as guaranteeing that at every merge commit, all of the tests pass, um, this creates an interesting social dynamic that I was a little surprised by when I first noticed it happening. Often, when you have a gatekeeper or maintainer and then a bunch of new contributors trying to get code in, it becomes a kind of a confrontational you versus me thing. It's, I want my code in, well, I want my uh, repo's quality to stay up, and it's kind of an unpleasant interaction to have. Whereas, when it's a robot instead of a person saying no, it goes from me against you to us against them. And it's not, how can I make sure this newbie doesn't break my tree? It's, let me show you how we can figure out what Boris is complaining about and fix it. So, if you want this kind of automation and you don't want to run your own Boris or your own Homu, there are a couple of things that it's pretty easy to do for free. First, set up continuous integration. If your repo is public and you have any tests, you have almost no excuse not to run at least some of them whenever you can. And GitHub has recently rolled out a protected branches feature where you can say, no one can force push to this branch. Pushes are, or pull requests are only allowed to merge if the checks that I've set up, such as continuous integration, have passed, and you can require the branches to be up to date, which gets you almost all the way to what we have with Boars. I'm pretty sure someone malicious could construct a degenerate case where you sneak some bad code in that Boars would have caught, but it would be kind of tricky. So that's your free and easy way to get uh, most of the not rocket science rule applied to your project. So, You've got this cool project, and you've got these new contributors coming by, and they, maybe they throw you a pull request or two. Now, the way I've seen this happen in other projects is you have a few maintainers who don't have a lot of time, and either somebody always responds to the pull requests and they start getting burnt out, start getting tired of answering the same questions, fixing the same problems, or the pull request just sits and waits until someone has time to look at it, and the newbie kind of wanders off, and three months later they go, oh, yeah. I thought that was cool a long time ago. Now everything's bit rotted, and then they just kind of leave. So we've solved that problem with a bot that says hi. It is High Five. And what High Five does is twofold. For every pull request, High Five makes sure that there's a reviewer assigned and nags that reviewer to actually take a look at it. And also, High Five will check the list of contributors to that repo and if the person submitting the pull request has not got any commits in the tree yet, they get a special welcome message saying, hey, here's the contribution instructions, here's some answers you might need right now, we're glad to have you on board. And you always get that message within minutes of submitting your pull request rather than having to wait. So what can you do if you don't want to run your own high five? Um, first, GitHub has recently rolled out pull request templates. Um, you can set a template that says, hi, welcome, have you done these things that we always need to check on pull requests? That'll get you part of the way there. The other major thing that High Five does is nags us to remember to actually take a look when it's time to review. So I would strongly recommend setting up hooks in whatever version control system you're using to nag you on email or IRC, someplace you'll actually check it when someone submits a pull request. So. Taking another step back, what about those potential contributors who don't even get as far as a pull request, who need some more help and need some more mentorship? We get especially a lot of those in Rust and in the Servo browser engine because they're such high profile, interesting projects. People go, wow, this is a really impressive thing to work on. I want to get started. But how? 
The old-fashioned way of handling this, which you might still do, is you have, everybody has their own kind of personal list of bugs that they care about, that they think would be good for a new contributor. And depending on who you ask, you'll get a different bug. It might or might not still be a problem. Um, and it's generally a lot of overhead for project developers who'd rather be fixing the code. So the way we've solved this for both Rust and Servo is to automatically scrape various tags on the issue tracker and provide a nice, friendly, approachable list of the issues tagged with them. This obviously relies heavily on how well you've triaged your code, but it also incentivizes us to do better triage because it's not just a label for us, it's a label for everyone who might come into the project. So you can check out Rust starters. If you're going to fork one of these for your own use, I would recommend forking from servo starters since they have some more um, cool features in it so far. Um, another thing to add, this was just written by a community member who thought it would be a cool thing for us to have. This wasn't a full timer on the project at all. Um, and so how do you get a thing kind of like starters? Let's say you don't want to spin one up. Let's say you're doing an open project and you want to pipeline more people in from the get-go. The first thing you need to do before adding your issues to any of these aggregators is going to be make sure your repo looks good when someone comes in through the issue tracker. Maybe contributors are usually funneled in through your website, which links to the wiki and the docs or something like that. But if you put your issues out for the world, people are going to go to the repo and try to find their way from there. So make sure your readme is up to date. Make sure you have a contributing guide that's up to date with who to contact, where to communicate with your project, how to ask. And then, once you're sure that somebody hopping in on an issue will be able to find their way around reasonably well, see about your issue tags. Make sure your contributing guide includes how to tag issues correctly and how to triage them, because if you submit your project to codetriage.com, helpful bystanders, maybe a few of the people who see your project there, will wander through and help you triage your issues. Once your issues are triaged well, um, you can get useful um, work out of this variety of other sites, which cater to different demographics, different levels of experience, but they're all focused on helping people find new open source projects to contribute to. Um, check them out. Also, if you're looking for code to write, they're, they're pretty cool. So basically, the things that I want you to take home about the robots is that the most important thing for fast development that Rust has done is automatically maintain a repository of code that always passes all the tests. That's the not rocket science rule. It's not rocket science, although it's quite difficult to do in practice. Um, welcome and guide your new contributors. This may sound like an open source specific thing, but even if you're working on an internal um, proprietary project at a medium to large company, maybe Bob over in accounting has asked you to teach him some web dev stuff. If you can point them at an easy tagged issue, then suddenly you might have another contributor on your team. And again, mark and share your introductory bugs. If you have a nice tracker for those introductory bugs, it can even motivate you to be better at your code triage because you get some reward from having done that triage. So there we go. I don't think we have time for questions, although I'll be letting you go to lunch with a minute to spare. You're welcome to grab a copy of my slides with all of the links that I've shown you. Tweet at me or ask me any Rust or community-related question. I won't know all of them, but I will probably know who to ask to find an answer. And I like learning new things. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope that you can improve your own community automation using some of the tools that you learned here.